So let's take a look at this buggy version of the sum2 function. I'm calling it on line 13 in the main with the argument 4, meaning I want to calculate the sum of the integers from 1 to 4. So we step into this and make a call to the sum2 function. Now notice that in addition to the parameter n, which is currently uninitialized, uh, the visualization is showing us that there are two other variables. These are local variables, sum and i, and once again, these are uninitialized for now. Now when we click next, n gets initialized to 4 because that was the argument that was called. And you see the bug, I have not initialized sum on line 2. So sum is still a question mark in this visualization. I is a question mark for now, but we do initialize it to 1. And now uh, we go to line 4. We're checking if i is less than or equal to n. Well, i is 1 and n is 4. So this condition i less than or equal to n is true. So we will go into the body of the while loop. And here on line 5, we're saying the new value of sum is the old value of sum plus i. Well, the old value of sum is uninitialized. Now when this code actually runs on a real system, it will produce an answer. Uh, it will, the variable sum will hold some value. We just don't have any control over what that value is, but the system will calculate something and we will probably get a garbage answer. I want to show you what happens in Python Tutor in the visualization. So when I click on next, you notice that the value of sum remains question mark. It was unknown to begin with. We have just increased its value by i, which was 1, but that's still unknown. So the visualization is just showing us that it doesn't know what that value is. So let's fix this because clearly this is a problem. Now we can edit this code and initialize sum properly to zero and rerun the visualization. So it's important to remember that uh, we may not detect this kind of a problem when we are compiling our code. This is one of the reasons why it's extremely useful to have this practice of initializing your variables at the time when you declare them. So we're back to the visualization. This time when we call the function, the variables, the local variables and the parameter are uninitialized. But now as we step through, each of these gets an initial value. So now let us look at the calculation of the while loop more carefully. So this condition, i less than or equal to n is true because i is one and n is four. So we go into the body of the while loop and we're saying we want to change the value of sum, increase its value by i. Sum is initially zero, so the new value of sum should be zero plus i, which is zero plus one, so the new value of sum should be one. Now on line six, we want to increment the value of i, so i becomes two. And now notice we've jumped back up to line four because we hit the end of the while loop on line seven, and a while loop, unlike an if statement, executes again and again as long as the test is true. Well, what is the test now? Is i less than or equal to n? Yes, two is less than or equal to four. So we go into the body once more. We increment sum by i, which is two. So sum jumps from one to three and i increases to 3, again we jump to the top. Once again, i is less than or equal to n. So we go in and we increment sum by 3. Sum is now 6, i is now 4. And now what is going to happen? Is i less than or equal to n? 
Yes, it's equal. And equal means the condition is still true. So once again, we will come in one more time. We will increment sum by 4. So sum is now 10. We will increment i to 5. And now when we check if i is less than or equal to n, now it's no longer true. So now in the next step, we exit the while loop. And we're now ready to return our answer sum, which is the sum of the integers from 1 to 4. And when we return this value, you will see that the answer 10 is printed in the text box uh, up here when we exit the sum to function. So this was a very simple visualization of the while loop. Now I'm going to take you uh, back to this point in the visualization where we had just called the um, sum function to begin with. We had just called the sum function here and we had started initializing the parameter and the local variables. I want you to keep this picture in mind where we have the parameter and the two local variables. I'm now going to edit this code. Instead of declaring my loop variable i over here, I'm going to use a for loop and I'm going to declare and initialize my loop variable right here inside the body of the for loop. And I'm going to increment i. Since I'm incrementing i there, I don't need this increment on line 5. And so I have this slightly more compact version of the code. And let me uh, visualize this. So remember, this piece of code should work exactly the same as before. It should still produce the same answer 10, but I want you to see how the visualization looks when we call the sum to function right here. Notice that in this picture, we only have the parameter n and the local variable sum. We don't have the local variable i because that local variable only comes into existence for the duration of the for loop. So I will show you that when we enter this for loop, we will see a new uh, variable i over here. And when we exit this for loop, then that i will disappear. So stepping through this one more time, sum init n initialized to 4, sum initialized to 0, and now we have uh, i coming into existence. It's uninitialized because we are yet to do this statement. But since we are now entering the for loop and i is declared for that, we now have an i. So i will be initialized to 1 and it is less than or equal to n. So when we write a for loop, it's a little bit uh, harder to see all the different parts. The initialization and the test all happened in one step. So this is one of the reasons why when you're learning this, you might find it easier to use a while loop, but uh, just be aware that the visualization for for loops is a little bit more compactly expressed. Now sum is going to increase by one. So sum is this, and we come back to the top and i is going to change to two, and it has shown you in a single visualization step, the increment of i, and the check to see that i is less than or equal to n. Once again, a little bit harder to follow the for loop version rather than the while loop version. We increment sum, i is now 3, it's still less than or equal to n, so we add that, i is now 4, it's still less than or equal to n, and now we increment i and find that it is no longer uh, less than or equal to n, so here we exit, to line 6 and return this sum. And notice that when we did this, the variable i has disappeared from this picture. It was there in the previous step and its last value was 4, but when we incremented it to 5, it was no longer less than or equal to n, so we exit the body of the for loop and then this i disappears. So if we only need to use a variable like i in this case for the duration of the for loop, it's a good programming practice to declare uh, uh, the variable here and of course initialize it right then and there. 
So I hope you found this uh, video useful. Please feel free to repeat uh, the visualization multiple times and of course try it yourself because that's the best way of trying to understand how loops work. They can be confusing, so do practice.